like to ask you to bow and pray with me, if you would, as we thank God for bringing us to this place, to this time, and what He has already blessed us with in worship. I want to thank Alan and the worship team and the musicians. Uh, matter of fact, I almost forgot I was in a Baptist church a couple of times, and my feet began to tap a little bit when I was listening to that. Let's bow and pray. Father, we thank you again for your love and your grace. You are so good to us. Not because we deserve it, but because your grace and your mercy have reached out and touched our hearts and our lives. Father, I thank you for Jesus, that through his death, burial, and resurrection, we have life and life eternal when we put our faith and trust in him. I thank you for the opportunity to live for him. Even as I challenge the folk here this morning at this great church, I ask that you just might challenge each of us to realize that you bring us into contact with people every single day who need Jesus, who need that encouragement, who need his salvation. And I pray that you would give us greater boldness, greater opportunity, and that you would help us to have the courage many times just to share what you've done for us. Father, again, I thank you for the worship. I thank you for your word, and I thank you for these that are here this morning and these that will be listening and that you might encourage them in some way through your word, by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you'll look with me in Acts chapter 8, I want to be looking over in verses 25 and following, but before I jump into all that, I want to just say how glad I am to be here. It's my first time, my wife, Terry, and I, uh, to be here inside of First Baptist Madisonville. I've been in Madisonville uh, quite a bit. I've preached around this area. I have several friends of mine. I already have run into some of the names, Bobby Sellers, Jeff Hendricks, different ones I've known uh, over the, the period of years. And, uh, and also, uh, I think Keith Roberts, I, I was his pastor, and uh, we worked together, and I know he's been in this area quite a bit as well, too, and uh, from Hopkinsville. Uh, I am with the Kentucky Baptist Convention, and I'm here to say on behalf of Dr. Chitwood and the Kentucky Baptist Convention, as Southern Baptists, thank you for your support of the cooperative program. Matter of fact, one of the things that you have unique in your history is Brother Coleman is the founder of First Baptist Madisonville back in the 1800s, and he also founded First Baptist Greenville and First Baptist uh, Hartford, and while he was preaching a revival, a man by the name of Boyce Taylor uh, was redeemed in that revival service who would become the pastor at First Baptist May or Murray, and out of that, is where we would even see from that beginnings at First Baptist Murray the program that we call today the cooperative program. It's where we together share commonality. And because we share that commonality, we have something to tell the world. My wife and I have been blessed by being a, as a regional consultant in western Kentucky. I grew up in the far western region. Uh, over in Ballard County is where I grew up, and my wife in Carlisle County. I pastored all through that area of the River Counties and have been in Hopkinsville as a pastor. Uh, we just came back from the mission field, though. It was quite an experience there in the mission field for a number of years in a country uh, that is far removed and, and in much darkness called North Carolina. They have, in that area, I was teaching at Southeastern Seminary, and around there at times, I would wear blue. And they were confused at times because of their pagan thinking, as though that I was for a school that was about five miles from where we were called Duke. I said, you need to understand where I'm from. I'm from Kentucky. And so I'm first for Kentucky, UK, second for any team out of the state of UK, and thirdly, any team playing against Duke. And I was very adamant about that, wasn't I, Terry? And uh, matter of fact, we had to straighten that out many times because they certainly needed the Lord in that place. They had certain mixed alliances. It is good being home. It is always good being in this area. Kentucky Baptist Convention and through your cooperative program dollars gives me the ability to be able to work with pastors, churches, and probably the most powerful resource we have is that as we gather together to seek God and that God the Spirit would give us guidance. Please know I'll be praying for your pastor. I was, uh, I was very pleased and excited whenever he texted me and I said I'd call him, but he said he couldn't talk. And so uh, I, and if he did talk, I couldn't hear him. 
and, uh, and so we kind of text back and forth a little bit, and, and uh, so I was privileged and uh, honored to even be able to be here this morning. Uh, we're looking in Acts chapter 8 because it is the story that is a very common story that crosses many cultural barriers. Those barriers being economic, political, racial, ethnic uh, barriers, and there are barriers that are similar to today, probably more so than at any time in our history. Because of what is called globalism, the ability to know that I can sit right here in this congregation while the sermon's going on, and I can check out anytime I want by having a smartphone, and I can go around the world in just a few minutes. I know what you're talking about in that, because I've seen kids when I was pastor at Second Baptist Hopkinsville, I remember walking down the aisle one time, and I was looking at somebody, and there was a, there was a teenager on this side, and another teenager on that side, and they were Snapchatting each other back and forth. And I said, why don't you just talk? And they looked at me like, where are you from, the dinosaur age? I said, yes, we actually talked back then. Today we don't even have to do that. We emoticon the whole thing uh, and don't even understand half of what's being going on there. But it's the world we live in today is global. Because of technology, transportation, the world as we know it has changed drastically. We're not in Kansas anymore, are we, Toto? It's changed that rapidly. And it's changing even more day by day. And yet there are unchanging aspects of God's Word. We may want to contextualize things as we talk about it because there's technology, there's opportunity, there's the ability to reach others who may not choose to walk in these doors, and you're doing that, and I compliment you for that. But in the midst of doing all of that, the greatest impact that First Baptist Madisonville or any other church can have is when God's people, those who are called by His name, take opportunity to take Christ out of the four walls of this church and share it with somebody. That's sharing life one with another. What this story talks about in Acts chapter 8, verse 25 through 40, it's the ability to understand that God the Spirit is moving. And you just watch the story as it unfolds here in a moment, that not only is God moving, He's bringing Philip in contact with somebody who needs Christ. And in the midst of bringing him in contact with that person, He provides all the need that is there, all of the opportunity that is there, and he provides grace when no one else thought grace could even be possible. Let's look at these passages together. Start with me in verse 26, if you would. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to the desert Gaza. So he got up and went. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, a high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians who was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. The Spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. When Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you remember what you're reading? Or do you understand it, rather? He said, how can I, he said, unless someone guides me so he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the scripture passage he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before the shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. The eunuch replied to Philip, I ask you, who is this prophet saying, uh, saying this about, himself or another person? So Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning from that scripture. So they were traveling down the road. They came to some water. The eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, 
and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him any longer, but he went on his way rejoicing. Philip appeared in Astos, passing through. He was evangelizing all the towns until he came to Caesarea. And we do ask God's blessings on this. He's looking at Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 through 8. That's the passage that's being talked about here. And out of this, we have an experience of how God works in sharing faith. I spent many years in the service. My wife and I were in a couple of different areas together. And I remember when I was in one, I happened to be a member of a church that had an organized outreach program. And out of that organized outreach program, over a period of a year, of many hours of being out, knocking on doors, doing things, and all those things were good. God began to convict me about something else. He said, Larry, you're willing to go out and knock on the doors of strangers, but those I bring you in contact with every day need Christ too. I began to get convicted about this. I was in the military, and there were folk all around me that were having difficulties and challenges and I might leave a track someplace, or if I were in a close context, I may talk to somebody. But I began to find out very quickly that if I made a concerted effort, like Philip here, to say, Lord, I want to serve you. I want to be sensitive to where you lead me. My very first point is this. As I look at this, Philip teaches us a lesson in the Scripture here. Be sensitive to the leading of the Spirit of God. It is God who leads people to someone, and he brings us into context. I've been in coffee shops. I've been in uh, places where I would just sit down, whether it's in an airport or someplace around where I meet somebody. I don't know. They don't know me. I can talk to a fence post. I mean, I don't have to know somebody. That's just my nature. That's who I am. You may not be that way. I am that way. But in doing that, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting sometime if I just took that forwardness to not talk about something other than Jesus Christ. What a joy that is. I find in verse 29 there, it said the Spirit led him that way. Look with me in that verse when he talks about it. He said, the Spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. I begin to see in this idea of, of understanding where the Spirit of God is, and you and I can be sensitive to that. You don't have to be a trained pastor. I've been teaching seminary for a lot of years, and I've been a pastor in a church for a lot of years. But God uses the simplest message with a person who has the most willing heart to go. Philip was not that highly skilled nor trained, but Philip had a heart to share what God had done for him. Be sensitive to the leading of the Spirit of God. I wrote a, a title here just on this. Remember, we do not have a message to sell nor to yell, but a message to tell. Sometimes, we hear the statement, the squeaky wheel gets the what? It gets the grease. It gets the attention. You don't have to be a loud mouth like me. You don't have to be somebody that is bold and going in. You don't have to have an ordination certificate. You don't have to have X number of Bible studies. You know what it is? It is your testimony and the blood that Jesus uses in the Word to bring people to Jesus Christ. I believe there are folks all around us who need Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And many times, just being sensitive to that helps us step outside of ourselves and begin to do something for someone else. Something I, I know as a counselor, I, I have a degree and worked in that for some time, and I know as a counselor, one of the things I didn't mind telling folks who were self-absorbed, they get depressed very easily. And it's not unusual for somebody who is depressed, whether it's an external thing that's going on, a circumstance, or whether it's something that may be going on inside of them chemically. The reality is this, in both cases, stepping outside of yourself to help someone else makes a difference in how you feel right now. It gives you a good feeling to be able to help somebody, to work somebody along, and to be able to do a favor for somebody like that. We're not talking about you doing a favor. We're talking about here just sharing the good news of what Christ has done for you. You know, I've said this for years, being one who grew up in a Christian home and in a Baptist church. I've been in there at times, and 
I've looked at it and I've even said it's, it's kind of comical to me personally that if you were to look at some people coming out of church, if you just looked at them, they're coming out of church. They've been in there for a couple of hours. People who've never been to church, they look at them and they say, look at their faces. Man, they look like they've been sucking on vinegar or something. What do they feed those people in there? They look unhappy. You and I, I'm not talking about having some artificial grin on our face, but you and I should have a joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. That ought to show up in our life, shouldn't it? And the best thing about it is, is when somebody wants to tell me how bad it is, let me tell you about how good Jesus is. We live in a day and time to where the media lives off the negative of life. And if they can find something negative, they're going to print it, they're going to quote it, they're going to say it, and if they can't, they'll make it up. That's the world we live in. And they're always indulging us with it. I remember one lady one time who, when I was pastoring a church, the first time cable news really became very popular was during the first Gulf War is what it was called. And I know that when that was through, she became almost agoraphobic to the point that she wouldn't get out of her house. She was strapped with fear. And it was getting her past some of the bad news, talking about what is the good news. Well, my friend, you and I have the answer to the needs of the world today, and he is Jesus the Christ. Notice this man who was here. He's an Ethiopian eunuch. It says a man who was in Candace's court who was in a high level, but he is more than likely an African because he's Ethiopian, so he is not the same as a Jew, even though he may have been a proselyte, a Judaize, or a Jewish proselyte, somebody who had come into the Jewish area of belief, but he's still searching for something. And it had nothing to do with his economic status, his racial status, or his nationality. It had everything to do. He had a need for Jesus Christ. That's what we should be focusing on. Be sensitive to the leading of the Spirit of God. You see, the Holy Spirit is the one who led him and gave him a ready heart to hear the good news. He's reading Isaiah 53, the great suffering shepherd passage. And out of that we find there is a challenge there. And the challenge is, tell them about the one who it is, Jesus the Christ. Verse 35, Philip began with that passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. I had a boss of mine one time who came to me. I was in the service. He was over me. He outranked me, and we worked together a lot. And he didn't have the skills I had as far as knowledge, training, because he was brought over to be in charge of it so he could get promoted. And I remember he came into my office one day, and he said, Larry, I know you're a, a holy man. Now, I don't know what that meant as a, a sergeant in the military, but I thought, you know, a holy man, okay. Uh, he said, well, I know you go to church. And he said, my daughter's been having nightmares about going to hell. And he said, I don't know what to do about that. And when he said that, you know, one of the most wonderful things was I knew exactly what to say about it. It wasn't because I was that smart. I just know the remedy for hell is heaven. And the avenue to heaven is Jesus the Christ. Now I said, now here's what I can tell you, Donnie. I know this. Somebody may have, may have shared this with her or not. I don't know that. I do know this, though. If there's a hell, there is a heaven. And if there is a heaven... I know the Word teaches me there is a way to heaven, and He is Jesus the Christ. I shared the gospel with Him, and my boss said then, I can't wait till Sunday to be saved. And I said, you know what's unique about it? You can do it right here, right now. All you've got to do is pray a simple prayer of realizing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He knelt his, he bowed his head, and he closed his eyes. He asked Christ into his heart. He got saved. He went home and he got excited about it. He called me and he said, come to my house. I shared faith with, it, with his wife. She got saved. The 12-year-old got saved. And it was wonderful seeing him in church the next Sunday. Not to get saved, because church won't save you. But it's trusting in Jesus. You see, in our world today, people think you and I are coming to church to be saved. No, we're not. I'm here to celebrate because I am saved. God in Christ. This is crazy. I've had people at times talk about going to church and they'll say, well, I really like 
uh, going to church. And that's wonderful, but it won't take you to heaven. I know a lot of people today will say, why would church didn't do anything for me? Now, do you know how silly that statement is? Well, how long did you go? How long did you stay? I've told many of folk this. Going to church is similar to going to a doctor's office when you're sick. If your pastor were to go to the doctor's office because he's sick and hang out for eight hours a day for two or three days, would that make him healthier? No. Who hangs out in a doctor's office? Sick people. You know who's here today? We get that. It's not that you go to the doctor's office that you get healed. It's not that you go to church and that you get saved. It's that you hear the great physician and you apply the remedy for where your need is. He is Jesus Christ. Churches have been commissioned to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 1.5 tells us, we gather together as Kentucky Baptists, as Southern Baptists, through the cooperative program, we reach around the world and we have missionaries, and you can proudly know that we have missionaries and church planners across North America and around the world today because we unite together for that cause to carry the good news of Jesus Christ. Verse 36 through 37, and I'm getting ready to close here in a second, is that it talks about in these verses about the very aspect of how God brought all this about. But if you look at that verse, he said as they were traveling, the Ethiopian eunuch, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? The water would not save him. What would keep him from being baptized? Being immersed. If you believe with all your heart, you may. Something I believe very strongly is this. God is not looking for you to say special words that have some kind of magic power. It's not some hocus pocus. This magic power rests in this. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. He died on a cross. The Bible says in Romans that He died on that cross. And as He died on that cross, then He rose the third day. And because of that, He offers life to all have faith and they put their faith and trust in Him. You see, give them a chance to respond. I can't save my child. I have a daughter. I've had the uh, blessing of baptizing her, of sharing Christ with my son-in-law, and uh, uh, he in turn later would share it with my uh, grandson and my granddaughter, and I baptized all of them. And what a joy that is to be able to do that and to be able to be a part of that because I can't make their choice, but they need to know Jesus Christ. And I'm sure there are people around us, all around us, that need Christ. You see, Philip's lessons here for us are once we believe in Christ, it's not over. He leaves us on earth for a reason, to share Christ with others around us. So what do we do? How do we respond to that? What do we do about that? 1 Corinthians 3, 6 says, One sows, another waters, but only God may give the increase. First, I would say this, overcome the fear of sharing your faith that you may not have the right words or the right response to the reply. Every time I talk to somebody in the military, especially because uh, I was around a lot of folks that were not believers, didn't grow up around it, that's the world we live in today. And out of that, they would ask me questions like, uh, you know, how did the earth get uh, started and where did Adam get, uh, get Eve? And, how did all, and so we get sidetracked real easy. Keep the focus on the gospel. It doesn't matter how much other knowledge they have. If they don't have Christ, none of that will ever make the difference. And don't worry about the fact they may not get saved. I water, I may be the one who sows the seed. It is God who gives the increase. You see, you have a story to tell. We together do. Do you know someone who needs to hear that story? Is there a friend? Is there a relative? Is there someone I work around? Is there someone in my neighborhood who needs that? Here's what I'd like to ask you to do as we get ready to close. I'd like for you to think about three people that you know all around Madisonville. And I don't know how many times I hear this said. Well, everybody around here goes to church anyway. Really? Our churches in western Kentucky today were once filled with people. But not so today. A lot of our younger families are looking for answers 
in travel ball, sports. They're looking for it in academics. They're looking for it in other things. I'm not against any of those things. I like sports. I like those things. But none of that will carry a child to heaven or develop the kind of character in them that you want. What will do that is Jesus the Christ. I'm convinced that we need to be sharing Christ more with those around us every single day. Three people, unchurched, maybe they once went to church or not, no longer do that. That person that you know will not confess Christ. Would you just do one thing and join with me in that? Begin to write their name down, pray for them every single day that you'll have opportunity within this next year to share Christ with them. You see, this is not for the church just to organize. It's for the believers to carry the good news wherever we go. Would you bow and pray with me? Father, I'm thankful for the good news. I'm thankful for Christ. For the invitation that we have now, whatever you lead and wherever you lead. Father, I pray that you would be the one who does the lead. Be with our musicians, be with our congregation. Help us to respond in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Would you stand?